You're not supposed to fit in everywhere. If you did, the world would be flat, boring, and sad. A monotonous bubble with no escape. Like cable news or LinkedIn. Kidding. Am I? So why do we expect every job to be a perfect fit? Let's face it, you're not everyone's cup of tea. And most companies aren't yours either. They don't value what you value. They don't work how you like to work, and they don't appreciate the way you sign off every Zoom call like Isaac from The Love Boat. Their loss. Finding the right fit at work is a topic that Andre Martin, organizational psychologist, consultant, coach, speaker, and author, knows all too well. <laughs> he literally wrote the book on it, Wrong Fit, Right Fit, Why How We Work Matters More Than Ever. It's a must read if you care about making work not suck. And we touch on a bunch of the book's insights during today's episode of the Desuckify Work Podcast. We talk about the $8 trillion in lost productivity each year due to disengagement. We explore the glossy sheen of company career pages and how they're the worst place to look if you're trying to find a right fit job. And we talk about the key distinction between right fit and fitting in. Fitting in is all about wearing a mask to avoid standing out. Right Fit is about finding a company or team where your values and way of working are embraced so you can stand out. I think Andre stands out in this conversation, so let's dive in. Okay, Andre Martin, welcome to the Desuckify Work Podcast. Hey, thanks, TJ. It's good to be here, man. Yeah, I'm glad to have you here. I'm excited. I, uh, I recently listened to your book, which we'll dive into, and it's awesome. Um, and I want to give people just a quick chance to to know a little more about you. So, so what are you doing for work right now, and how did you come to be doing it? Yeah, so I've got a little bit of a portfolio life going on right now. So there's probably nice. three buckets of things that are that are current. The first one is I I do some independent consulting, so I do a fair amount of high performing teams, executive coaching work with. Uh, with a variety of companies. I think mm -hmm. the second one is I, I'm an operating advisor for a couple of growth equity firms. And okay. so I do a lot of human capital work with early stage entrepreneurs, helping them sort of build culture, uh, build better leaders. And then last but not least, I'm a culture strategist at Joyful. Joyful is a Portland-based creative agency that basically took all those creative sort of juices mm -hmm. and fed them towards how do you communicate a much stronger sense of what a culture is, how a place works, what its purpose is to the employees that are inside of a company. Wow, that's a pretty good little portfolio. I like it. Um, what Thanks, I mean, you know, having come from the the agency world, I love that idea of what you're doing there at Joyful. I think that's awesome. How did you How did you get to to this place? You know, what what's your background? Yes, yeah, so my background is I'm an organizational psychologist by training, so mm -hmm. total geek at heart. Mm -hmm. um, I love studying, you know, organizational systems and structures and motivation in the workplace. And that took me just to a variety of super cool companies. Started off at Disney in the guest experience area, mm -hmm. so helping to build sort of a better guest experience day to day in the parks in Florida. Nice. Uh, and, and to Center for Creative Leadership, which is a big executive development firm. Then on mm -hmm. to some big brands you probably know. I worked at Mars. I was at Nike, Target. And then so my last big gig was at Google as the as the head wow. of talent. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that's a nice, nice mix of brands. And I like that they're uh, it's a very diverse group of brands. Like they're all top tier, but they're very different industries. So I imagine you got exposed to some different ways of working in those spaces. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, and I'd say, you know, we, you know, this TJ, we often create what we know. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason that book came to life yeah. was realizing that, hey, there isn't one way to run a company. Mm. You know, a talent that's going to be super uber successful at Google, probably not going to be as great at Nike, mm -hmm. probably not going to be great as Target, probably not going to be as good at, at Mars. So this idea that, you know, it's not just one sense of what makes a great workplace or a, or a great culture. It really does come down to this sort of match mm. between who's the talent, how mm. do they like to work, and then how does the company get stuff done? Mm. I really like that insight because I think, I think in some ways, a lot of companies right now are, are sort of cut and pasting what they see as the, the right culture versus owning 
who they are at their core in terms of what they believe in, what they strive for, what they, what they want to accomplish, but then doing, you know, optimizing that so that whoever likes that can really thrive and, and, and do well there. Um, I want to dive into all this, but I do want to get a quick, temperature check on how you feel about the state of work right now. I've always asked people, where does it fall on the suck meter? And I know you're deep in this, so you probably have a good sense of this. Um, how sucky or not sucky is work right now? Hey, TJ, I think it's, I, I think it's pretty sucky right now. <laughs> yeah, I really yeah. do. And here, here's what I'd say to you. I think there's a couple, couple vectors that's coming from it. I think first is, you know, I've been sort of really compelled by this piece of Gallup research that says there's $8.8 trillion of lost productivity wow. in our workplaces due to disengagement. Hmm. And I'm less sort of interested in the P&L piece of that, although I think that's pretty compelling. I'm mm -hmm. more interested in just saying, God, the creative juice that we have in our companies mm -hmm. it isn't flowing. Yeah. It's not flowing to the places that it should be. And so that number tells me that, hey, there's a lot of people who are probably really dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. narrowed version of who they become at work. Yeah. I think the, the second thing that's been a really big um, aha for me is this idea around burnout. Mm. You know, we talk a lot about how burnout's really prevalent in the workplace right now, but maybe not for the reasons we think. Burnout isn't a question of I've got too much on my plate in the moment. Mm -hmm. but there's this great book called Burnout that's out there that basically positions burnout as this idea that uh, – it's actually about not allowing ourselves to go through the stress cycles fully. Hmm. And so if we don't go all the way through a stress cycle, we end up carrying that. Hmm. And then the stressors that come, just hmm. the less capable we, we, we are able to handle our day. And so I think there's a piece around burnout that's like, we've gone through all these massive stress cycles, yeah. right? Now, I don't know that we've taken the time to sort of fully process those. Yeah. And then the thing man is is i just you know i feel like there's a lot of people that maybe ended up in companies that just don't work the way they want to work yeah and and companies are trying to be all things to all people mm -hmm. doing what you said which is hey the best road always I and mean, you're a brand guy the best road always is stand for something yes right? stand yeah. for something don't try to be everything to everybody it just mm -hmm. will not pay off in the long run yeah all of those things c connect for me. I think if, if you if you start with what you just landed on, which is this, don't be everything, try, don't try to be for everybody. I think, you know, and I think we can get into this a little bit because there's some interesting tension there between a, a very well-intentioned and needed movement towards inclusion and belonging that I think can cause some folks to, to flatten themselves versus yeah. realizing it's okay to stand for something, but then once people show up, allow them to bring who they are to the table. And that kind of comes back to that first point, which is when you talk about all this lost productivity, it's all this creative juice that for a number of reasons, people aren't just able to get out of themselves, whether they feel like they're in the wrong fit or they're going through something personally, or they've gone through some of these stress cycles and they're just loaded with that stuff. And, and I think companies are struggling to figure out how to set the table in a way that people show up and, as much of their creativity as possible can come out and, and not be, you know, restrained in some way. Um, what do you, what do you think is, you know, the best way to define this idea of fit? I know that's, that's kind of what you get into yeah. your book, you know, uh, wrong fit, right fit. Right. And I, uh, I think that word can feel a little loaded. So I want to get a quick, yeah. quick d definition from you. What is fit exactly? You know, for the purpose of the book, at least, I mean, fit was was really around this idea of a deep and authentic dedication, mm -hmm. and how a company works day to day, mm -hmm. and, you know, and finding the right word for it. I think two things were on my mind. One is, you know, I think it's OK to sort of lean into loaded terms. Yeah, <laughs> I think you have to. Right. I think it's mm -hmm. the only way it works. And so this idea of like a lot of people bristle at fit. And I think what they're actually bristling at is this inherent. um seemingly practice, seeming practice that we have to fit in, mm. right? This idea, and you see a lot of dis disenfranchised groups that from their communities to the schools, the companies they work in, they've been asked to inherently change who they are mm -hmm. and fit into a system, thus not bringing, being able to bring their whole self. Yeah. I think the way I'm talking about the term is a little bit different in saying, hey, the more you have to fit in, 
the less of your creative energy is going to go to your craft. Mm. So find a place that works the way you work. And one of the analogies I use, TJ, which works, I think for me, I don't know if it does for anyone else, is it's sort of like dating, (laughs) right? I mean, think about how many failed relationships we had to have Mm -hmm. to find a partner in life. Yeah. And, you know, it was inherently about, hey, often those failed relationships didn't work because we were trying to be someone that we're just not. Mm -hmm. And what happens in our best relationships is we find the person that's like, hey, warts and all, I love you. (laughs) And I think that's what my sort of idea of fit is around. I'm like, hey, let's not try to let's not try to fit in. Let's not try to present ourselves as something that we're not. Mm -hmm. Actually do a much better, deeper, richer job of finding the place that works how we work. So our creative energy flows to our craft Mm -hmm. and not to the context, the coordination of work or trying to fit in. Mm. I love that distinction of fit versus fitting in. Cause I think as soon as you say fitting in, everybody probably feels that everybody kind of cringes at that. Everybody recognizes that in themselves. I think the analogy with dating is helpful there too. Cause you know, somebody might look great on paper, and and then you spend a few dates with them and you're just like, I, I cannot be me around yeah. you. And this is awful. And I don't know, whatever. So it's the same thing as if somebody might show up to Google and go, I should love it here. Yeah. It's the best. And yet I don't. And I think that brings me to, and I want to explore this a little bit from both the individual side and the organizational side. Maybe we start on the individual. How can you get really clear on what a good fit looks like for yourself. Yeah, I think it all starts with um, with doing some pretty deep and honest Mm self-reflection kind of around this idea of what are you solving for? Right. Mm -hmm. I think often what happens to us, TJ, is we're in a job for whatever reason, that position, that job, that company starts to feel dissatisfying. Mm -hmm. And our immediate instinct is to go look for another job. Yeah. What I'm trying to tell people is I'm like, that's the worst possible thing you could do. Because mm. the minute you open a job ad, you are in one of the biggest marketing machines ever made. Yeah. Right. So it's equivalent of like you're on these constant first dates and you're not really getting the truth. So the first thing I tell people is, hey, you got to stop and take stock. Mm. Ask yourself things like, what do you value? How do you like to get work done? Mm-hmm. Your ideal manager. What are you solving for long term? That is, where are you trying to get five to 10 years from now? Mm-hmm. Solving for right now? Mm-hmm. What's, your, what's your career about? Is it about company? Is it about craft? Is it about cause? And if you do that body of work, mm-hmm. and at the very least, when you go to that first interview, you open that first job advert, you're going to be able to be a little bit more discerning. Mm. Yeah, a couple things in there that are interesting. I think uh, the notion of company craft or cause kind of piques my interest. And then having read the book, I, I get it. But I remember being, when I first heard the term, I was like, hmm, where do I fit on yeah. that? So can you can you go a little deeper into what that means? Yeah, I can. It's been one of those, you know, ahas that's come out through the years, TJ, which is careers are utterly in service of, of one primary outcome. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I try to boil it down into three simple things so people can sort of absorb it. I think on one hand, there are careers that are simply about a company, mm-hmm. right? We know these people, they find a place, mm-hmm. we either love the product, they love the brand, they have a great leader that they work for, it's in their hometown, and so they grew up with it, mm-hmm. or of company, yeah. right? They will stay at that company and work at that place for the rest of their lives if they can. Mm-hmm do that, you have to design your career a certain way. Yeah, You can't stay in one function. You can't stay in one position. You need to build as broad of a network and as broad of an understanding of how that company makes money or have impact mm-hmm. in order to make sure you have longevity of your career there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very different than craft people, right? In our, you know, in our work, marketing or in my space, there's a lot of people who are of craft. And yeah. what that simply means is your career is in service of you going deep in this area that you just love, mm-hmm. right? I'm a conversational psychologist. I'm just a geek for all things organization, motivation, mm-hmm. leadership and the like. And, and I think when you're building that career, you know, one of the mainstays of that career is you can't stay in one place. Mm-hmm. The only way you're going to have depth of experience is if you can see and work in practice that craft in a lot of different systems and environments. Yeah. 
And then there's people of cause, right? And these are the people that are like, they are fired up every day to either solve a big injustice in the world Hmm. or answer a giant question that is just plaguing us all. Hmm. And when you're of cause. I mean, the one thing about a cause, and you know this, I mean, any movement that's ever happened in the world, you have to be in the center of gravity. Mm-hmm. You have to be around the people who are doing the most cutting edge work in the most progressive way, pushing the borders as far as you can pers- push them. Mm-hmm. And so in that sense, instead of, you know, thinking about, hey, have I seen enough systems? It's like, am I around the people who are doing the most important work in the space? And one way I always talk about that is I grew up in the Ozark Mountains in Missouri. Mm. Imagine if I was living in Southern Missouri and wanted to, you know, solve the pollution in our oceans. Mm. Really hard to do from the center of the United States, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, like, you got to get to a coast. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that idea is a lot of people don't sort of step back and say, what kind of career am I actually building? Yeah. And so, therefore, they're not very thoughtful about each of the steps they take. They're really making those decisions on a pretty short term set of criteria. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of thinking it through for myself. I definitely didn't have that language. I think intuitively I was playing in the craft space. You know, I went into advertising as a copywriter and ultimately a creative director. So I think I dug in deep there. I think as I've moved into the world of coaching and some of that stuff, uh, the cause side is, is starting to buzz for me a little bit more. The craft is still there, but so I'm sort of maybe still figuring that out a little bit, but I love having that language I, I love the idea that some folks might just be, you know, totally enamored with what Apple's doing or what Google's doing or what whoever's doing and want to live in there too. And um, so I think that that's a really helpful, just quick and easy thing, right? I mean, it's not going to probably take a second, but it's super simple the way you've set it up. Where do you fit? And then this other layer that you introduced, which is something that shows up a lot in this book. And I, I love it because it's, it's very on the ground versus up here lofty. I mean, you get a little into some of that mission, vision, values, but there's the, how do we work? How do I work? Or as a company, how do we work? And I have a sense that on either side of that question, not everybody knows that. I mean, if you ask me, how do I like to work? My first instinct would be like, I don't know, like in a way that's not annoying. You know, I'd I'd kind of have all the words of like, I've been where it's frustrating, crazy, chaotic, whatever. So I don't want that. But how do I actually do it? I don't know. And then I've been at companies where if you ask, how do we work? I guarantee you, you'd have 10 different answers from 10 different people. And the top people would be like, I don't know. So how, how can an individual, let's start there. How can an individual start to assess how they work, how they like to work. Yeah. T- I mean, you're hitting TJ, your, your sort of description of all that is sort of what I found coming through all those interviews. Mm-hmm. Inherently, we have a secret decoder ring for how we like to work. Mm-hmm. We never put language to it. Yeah. And so literally in the book, there's a, you know, a 50 some item assessment that sort of takes these continuums of how work gets done. And it covers some really interesting categories, right? Things like, mm. how do you set strategy? Mm. How do you like to solve problems? How do you manage conflict? How do you give feedback, develop? How do you socialize ideas? Mm. What's your relationship with time? All these things that make up a, a random sort of Wednesday at work, right? <sighs> And yet we never sort of have the frame for them. And one of the things that I'll tell you, like, really quickly, just an example is socializing ideas is a really great one, right? Because Mm -hmm. there are companies that in order to socialize or have an idea gain speed, you have to create a beautiful brand ready, filled with poetry deck, right? It's going to have 40 slides. It's going to just be, man, it's going to be like fireworks and light shows. Mm-hmm. And you got to shop that around to everybody. And in those kind of companies, often you're getting feedback on the aesthetic mm-hmm. and the content. Yeah. Right? And then there's companies that socialize ideas through a two-page memo. You know, mm-hmm. Amazon's probably most famous for that. Yeah. Right? Pithy, full sentence. And then there's places like Google that they're going to prefer a you know, 20-page research paper. Mm-hmm. And so if you think about it, like that simple part of work if you don't like creating brand ready decks, mm-hmm. well, then you go to a company that does that and you're going to feel like you're riding with your non-dominant hand every single day. You're having to communicate in a way that's just not natural for you. Yeah. So the first thing I'd say to individuals is just step back from those big questions and ask yourself, like, how do you like to do those things? Mm. 
right? That's yeah. the first thing. And I think for companies, you know, you hit this too, TJ, is that, you know, a lot of the CEOs that I talk to, when we get to this thing about how we work, they're like, I don't know, we just do. <laughs> and, and part of the reason is because they've been in the system for so long, right? Yeah. It's just natural. It's either mm -hmm. how they love to work or they learned how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people, we do a disservice because a lot of the companies we go into today, the thing you hear when you join again and again is, hey, this place is a little crazy. You just got to take time mm -hmm. to figure it out. <laughs> like, yeah. The worst advice in the world, because every time I bump into the company, mm -hmm. and I realize, oh, my God, that's a different way of working. I didn't know. Inherently, I, I find that out because I did something the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And all that does is just chip away at your engagement. Mm -hmm. And it leaves you feeling less competent and less confident. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I feel all those things because I've been in those settings. And right. again, I've, I've just had to sort of absorb them intuitively rather than having the language to get at it ahead of time. You know, it's funny you talked about the decks. And I think in the world of advertising, you might think that everyone in advertising kind of wants to have the pretty 40 page deck. It's not really true. What I found is, and you'll see this on LinkedIn, people will share like, why are we spending so much time on the deck versus the content? And there's so much frustration there. And it would be, it would be amazingly helpful to know or to be able to ask in an interview or to ask your friends who've worked there before, how do you guys do your stuff? Like, are you guys all about that? Are you guys making the prettiest damn deck in the world that maybe doesn't exactly say anything? Um, or do you just like put something together quick and then it's all about getting in front of somebody and having a conversation? Um, I feel like all those kinds of conversations are not, they're just not happening because we don't even know to ask them, you know, to start them. We just, we know when we don't like it, we bristle, like you said, and then we either feel trapped. Uh, another feeling I think is really common is like suddenly all of your energy, and this has happened to me, goes into making it more like what you like. Yeah, we great. do it that way. Let's do it this way. And you're just, you're trying to yank all this stuff into your space. And it's like, uh, oh, you know, I get it, but it's really fruitless because this is baked in and that's how they like to work. So um, when somebody, I want to come back to that notion of when you're in a company and, and you've got that itch to leave, how do you, how do you decide that it's a legitimate itch to leave? Meaning I've noticed some things that I don't like to work with versus maybe it's just on board or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, TJ, I mean, this is one of the, I think, the most uh, insightful pieces from, from the interviews was this idea that, like, often in companies that we have right fit, a few mm -hmm. things were, right? One is, is people took it for granted, mm -hmm. right? And so my wording for that is that they often mistook comfort for boredom, mm. right? A deep, committed relationship doesn't have the dopamine hits. Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't. It like it, it's like a warm hug every day, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a lot of people that when they look back, I ask them, I'm like, "Hey, you left your right fit experience. Mm -hmm. Back now, like, why did you do it?" And they're like, "I think two things happened. One is I was bored, and I I thought I was bored. I was probably just really comfortable. Yeah, I underestimated how much the way the company worked allowed mm -hmm. me to be a success. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the third thing is. Honestly, when the recruiter called me, it just felt good to be seen and valued and wanted. Yeah. Yep. I'm like, that happened more times than I can tell you. Yeah. And so I think that idea of like, hey, one of the things I, I want people to do more, especially in this era of like infinite browsing and FOMO and like, it looks like there's greener grass everywhere, man. Yeah. I just want people to take stock a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Right? Because the truth is, there's no perfect fit. Right. Every organization, even the ones that are the best in the world, you're going to go through this EKG rate out where some days are going to be great, some days are going to be really tough. Yeah. And in this day and age, we just, we're jumping too fast. And so take stock more often. I would say go back to those excursions in the book. Mm -hmm. You should do them once a quarter. Mm. Right. Because yeah. I think you'll just remind yourself, or anytime a recruiter calls, mm. right, before you pick up the phone, take some stock and just yeah. go, hey, Am I really ready to leave? Am I underestimating what this system means to me? Um, because most people that left those jobs for something else, they rarely were more satisfied. Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah. And all of that really hits because I've experienced all of those things sometimes in one job, meaning I've, I've been at jobs where it was definitely, if not exactly the right fit, very close. And I can think of the moments where the recruiter or somebody called and yeah, there is that dopamine hit of somebody likes me, somebody wants me, somebody sees, sees me. And maybe because I'm feeling a little bored, I'm wondering if my current place sees me and values me because it's all just like comfortable. Um, and then like you, you do, I think the thing that you struggle with in that comfortable space is the thing you might want from another job. I know for me, I often just didn't explore if that was possible in my current job. Meaning if I want to be challenged more, if I want to learn something new, um, you almost just kind of go, well, it's not showing up. Yeah. It's not obviously right in front of me. So therefore I need to go somewhere else if I want to get kind of uh, re-energized again. Um, how do you're, you're, you're right on it, man. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but no, like I have a lot of passion for this piece of it, which is, you know, yes, I think we can all do a little bit better job mm -hmm. of embracing the fact that, hey, I've got capacity. Mm -hmm. Hey, I've got skills. Because the truth is, is any job you take in a company, you become a really narrowed version of yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? You become the sliver of who you are. And part of our duty, I think, as good employees is to say, hey, don't forget, I'm actually this broad. Yeah. When there's opportunities to do these other things. Mm-hmm. I'm willing, I'm capable. And I think, I don't know that we do that well enough ourselves. The other yeah. thing is for, you know, for companies, I, I often wonder if we spend way too much of our time on the 20% of the people, mm -hmm. just a pain in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> right? We sort of take our highest performers, the people that fit, people mm -hmm. that have capability, the people who have proven themselves and the people that are doing really tough work. Mm -hmm. We tend to just leave them to it. Yeah. Right. We do. And so I think from an organizational standpoint, a leadership standpoint, I always tell people, I'm like, hey, hey there's a 20, 60, 20 rule of, of sort of engagement. 20% mm -hmm. of the people are going to follow you everywhere. Mm -hmm. No matter what you say, they're with you. 20% yeah. are going to fight you no matter what you do. And 60% mm -hmm. are sitting on the fence. Mm -hmm. you want the 60% to be engaged. You got to put your energy into the group that you want them to fall towards. Mm -hmm. I have, as a leader, give all my time to all the people who are just dissatisfied and in an uproar. And what, then the 60% are going to look at that and go, hey, the only way to get my leader's attention is to be a pain. Yeah. Right. And so I always, I'm, I'm like, focus all your attention on the people who are, they're fit, they're doing great work, they're your highest performers because you're giving everyone. Mm hmm a metric for what greatness looks like in this company. Mm. Yeah. I, I love, I love that. There's a couple of things that, that show up for me there. I mean, I think as somebody who's maybe been in that right fit situation, you got, you're, you're, you're sort of craving that and you maybe just don't know how to ask for that kind of attention. Um, I also, you know, I had someone on this show a while back, his name is Patrick Riley, not the basketball coach, but he's working with both companies and individuals creating a fuller story of who you are so that you can really sort of socialize that within a company. That's a lot of what he's doing. Cause I think if you look at our LinkedIn profiles and our resumes, it's kind of like, Oh, you, you know, in advertising, Oh, he's the person who did those kinds of campaigns. I can trust him to do those kinds of things. He knows how to write these kinds of scripts, whatever I lean into it. And you don't realize how much more there is to people. I think, I think some of that, you know, $8 trillion in lost productivity is from companies not really being able to, to pull more out for, that people are, are actually ready to give. They just don't quite know where it fits. And so bringing those conversations together, I think is, is a really, really big deal. Um, have you, you seen, see, I, want, I, want, I want to hook on that for a second, yeah. right? You, you said something that again is, is super intriguing to me. Um, and that's just this idea of, of, hey, when you think about the distribution of work, mm -hmm. there's two primary factors that you should be sort of viewing that through. The first one is, is this work meaningful to the individual who's being asked to do it? Mm -hmm. And is this work high impact to the company? Mm -hmm. And the more we can sort of align those two things as we distribute work, mm -hmm. the more productivity, engagement, commitment and 
sort of forward momentum we get. So on the meaning side, I think the thing you're talking about right here is, is if I don't know you as a talent, yeah, how can I ever sort of give you work that's inherently going to be more meaning? And so as a, as a manager, one of the things I tell any manager in the world is every time you sit down with your employee, ask them if the work they're doing feels meaningful to them. Mm. Right. And if yeah. not, what work would you like to do? And it might be because you want to develop, you want to grow, you want to, or there might be skills you had one day in the past that you want to return to. I mean, I remember joining teams. I had a couple of teams I joined, all learning and talent teams. And I had an ex-AP journalist. I had a unbelievable graphic designer who was doing sort of like learning facilitation. And mm. you better believe as soon as I heard that, I'm using those skills. Yeah. Right. Because mm -hmm. then they're just that much more engaged and finding meaning in their day to day work. Yeah. I love that as a, a tool for a manager to make that part of your, your regular engagement, just to see if people are feeling meaning. And if not, what what would meaningful work look like? Getting curious about what their their other skill sets are like, because we often just know people as they show up. Um, it also, you know, this may sound a little self-interested, but as someone who is a coach and I think of my experience, coaching was not really available. And, and I think of, I'll lump it in with coaching and training. And I just think investing in people in a way that gets some of, that would actually surface some of that information. Meaning if somebody was, was maybe getting coached on your team over time, a coach is probably going to start to surface some of those things and maybe give people the tools, the comfort to, to speak up about Oh, there's more that I want from my career here. Oh, I didn't even know that I could ask to do something other than this little box that I was in. And then on, on the company side, yeah, just building the infrastructure, building the training your people to be curious. And, and through that lens of people are capable of so much more than we give them credit for. And uh, there's so much value that we're leaving on the table um, and, and getting getting leaders and managers curious about that, I think would be huge. And TJ, like there's just, and you brought it up, like, there's just this sense. And I, you know, I'm a learning development guy from, from 20 years. And mm -hmm. I will tell you, like life's the greatest classroom on earth. Mm -hmm. in the day and age that we're living in, in the disruption, the, the unpredictability, all this sort of continued advancement that we make, mm -hmm. like, you don't really need a development program. Right. What you do need are two things. One is you need really heavy doses of self-awareness. Mm-hmm need really good feedback from people you trust that are helping you to sort of continue to work on your edges mm -hmm. and then you just need strategies to reflect on all the things that are happening to you mm -hmm. to turn them into better habits downstream and i think again if we just had that mm -hmm. imagine how much different the day looks right instead of all it just being you know stress and crap and hardship and meetings mm -hmm. say hey there's things that i can pull from this mm -hmm is indeed the greatest classroom on earth. Yeah, I love that. And I love the, the idea of self-awareness. And I think both from the lens of any individual and then from an organizational self-awareness and how those two can then come together, I think, and create some of what you're talking about. Um, there was something you mentioned earlier I want to just come back to because that that idea of the dopamine hit of, of a new job and the idea that you're when you when you see whether you're talking to a recruiter or you look at the company website or you get the first interview tour through the right spots in the office. Um, companies are, are clearly presenting a, a very shiny version of themselves. Um, how can, I'll start with the, ind the individual showing up in that, how can you sort of resist the charms of those dopamine hits a little bit and get yourself into a place where you're maybe asking the right kinds of questions through that process so that you can find your right fit. Well, I, you, you know, I think the first thing TJ is, is you just have to walk in realizing that you're getting a shiny version of the truth, mm -hmm. not flat out lies, but they mm -hmm. are presenting a really aspirational version of the company. Mm -hmm. I think if you walk into that, you start to even just that alone, you're a little bit more discerning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the thing I would tell every talent first is don't waste the last five minutes of interview when you have a chance to ask a question. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I wish we gave more time to interviewees to be able to ask questions. The truth is yeah. you probably get the last five, yeah. right? And we, and we typically toss in layups. Mm -hmm. About working there, what's great about the company? And it's yeah. like, this is your one chance to go a little deeper. And so for mm -hmm. me, I have a couple 
questions I like to use. The first one is, is tell me about an individual who's been a tremendous success there. Mm. I want a real person. Who are they? Where do mm -hmm. they come from? How did they show up? How do they work? Like you can just go deep because once you get a real person to talk about mm -hmm. shiny, shininess, this inherently comes off. So yeah. that's, you know, that's one question I like. I also love the one that, you know, what happens here that didn't happen at the other places you worked. Mm. Yeah. To give you a sense on really what's differentiated, what may be, you know, oddity. And you can learn a lot about culture and that because people, again, it's a it's a question they're not ready for. So they're going to think and they're going to be a little bit raw -er in their yeah. in their description. Mm -hmm. I think the third thing that I would tell talent is you got to interview outside of the interviews. Mm -hmm. Right. So one of the other strategies I like to use is, you know, get on your LinkedIn profile and find a person who worked at that company for at least three to five years mm -hmm. and they've recently left mm. and get on the phone with them and interview them about what it's like to work there. Don't look for all the skeletons in the closet yeah. and all the bad stuff, but literally just say, Hey, I'm super curious about it. Tell me what it's like to work there. Mm -hmm. How they set strategy, solve problems, socialize idea, how they give feedback, how they develop you. What's the relation with time? What do people's calendars mm -hmm. do? Mm. All those questions, and they're going to probably give you the the truest yeah. version because they're no longer there, and they were uh -huh. there long enough to care about it. Yeah, I think that's great, and I love that there's sort of those there's this little bucket of questions that can apply in all those situations. Meaning, you know, how do they work? How do they approach strategy? You know, what's the relationship with time? Which I feel like we could do a whole episode on that alone right. because I'm working on that myself, and it's not an easy thing. But I think. I just think it's an interesting and fresh question because I think most people would would never think to go, what is the relationship with time in my company? You might go, I'm always busy or it's crazy here, but the relationship with time starts to open something up interesting. So I love that you've got this package of ways of thinking about the work experience that can show up in the recruiting process, in the, in the onboarding process. Now it's suddenly like, I can actually witness this and I can explore this and maybe I can talk to some people and and I can notice how my calendar is filling up and, and all those things. Um, and again, I think the simple awareness that even in the onboarding phase, you might be getting a little bit of a shiny version, you know, go have lunch with this person, you know, we're going to, you know, like everything's still, you still have a little bit of the buzz from I'm in a new place and this is exciting. So to give people a strategy for moving through that in a way that's like you said it's not looking for the skeletons in the closet you're just going is this the right fit for me i i deserve this and you know i think the the thing that shows up for me too is you know even when you come through the interview process i would recommend and i'm curious your take on this don't wait to ask questions until the end when you're talking come questions will come up and if you're sort of prepared with some thoughts if somebody starts talking about something and maybe it leads you to the relationship with time area bring it up 10 minutes into the interview like how do you guys deal with time here what's scheduling like what's what's your meeting culture um you don't need to wait until somebody asks you is that is that something that you would you would recommend as well 100 percent. i mean i think it's you know it's impending on the interviewee to make that a conversation Mm -hmm. I mean, again, one of the questions I like to ask is, hey, take me through your calendar tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Walk me through the entire day. Yeah. And I mean, that can just be such a great look and micro look at, at the culture. And and again, you know, we don't have a lot of chances in those interviews to ask questions, but you've got to create the space for yourself. Mm -hmm. You got to realize that this is as much about you selling who you yeah. are as it is just ensuring that you're not going to land in a place that you're going to bounce out of a year and a half later, because that is just so much more detrimental. Yeah. Because the thing about transitions, and we fail to talk about this, is, is transitions are can be really harmful to your career, right? Every time mm -hmm. you move a company, think about it. You set back your relational capital to zero. Mm -hmm. Your entire network's brand new. Mm -hmm. right? Your reputational capital is back to zero. That means no one knows who you are, Mm -hmm. what you can do, what you're about, whether or not you're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. And you have to learn a, a brand new system of working, new lingo, new abbreviations, new systems, new structures. When you look at that, those three activities, mm -hmm. that's a full 18 months of your life. Yeah. 
right? So two things are happening in that 18 months. One is most of your creative energy isn't going to your craft. Mm -hmm. And secondly, you're therefore not getting better at what you're supposed to be best in the world at doing. Mm. And so you can really do some damage to just your overall skill set if all mm -hmm. you're doing is transitioning all the time. Mm. You know, so when I'm talking to early stage talent, I'm seeing these like folks are like two years and two years and two years and two years. I'm like, hey, great. But just realize that all you're really good at now is transitions. Mm. That's fascinating. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I come from the, that world of advertising where that's fairly normal. Um, and but I get it. I think there's moments where I transitioned where it definitely was necessary. And then there's moments where, you know, I might have been able to to explore more had I had these kinds of tools and these kinds of questions uh, at the ready. Um, so I, I love that advice. Just I think we we undervalue things like relational capital and stuff like that. I think we just particularly if you're of craft, you are just so focused on it's just all about the work. Yeah. And yeah, the work matters. But so many people that I've encountered, certainly even as, as, as coaching clients and just in my career, I was pretty good at networking. That's something like I always just kind of gravitated towards and uh, it was natural, but so many folks are just don't like it and they yeah. don't understand the value of it. And, and I think they have a vision of networking that is the sort of gross, like, you know, what can I get from you? What can you get, give me kind of thing versus the simple fact of building relationships and, you know, kind of getting into that space of knowing somebody, liking somebody and trusting somebody so that you can then support each other, whether it's in the current job or down the road. Um, what what would be your sort of quick advice to somebody who maybe undervalues that that relationship? Well, I, I would just say this. I would like, hey, look at any great sports dynasty, mm -hmm. any great, you know, special ops team. Any really, really proficient um, executive team, the vast majority of those have stability and membership, mm. right? Because the more that I have trust and knowledge of you mm -hmm. and my team members, the more we're naturally sharing information, yeah. the more we are making use of complementary skills. Mm. Or I know about how to shortcut things with you so we can continue to move the work we're trying to move faster. I mean, imagine if you had a basketball team competing for the NBA championships and in that series, that final series, mm -hmm. you actually had to change your starting five every single game. <laughs> I mean, think about like it's you, there's no way you win. I don't yeah. care who's I don't care who's on the floor. There's no way you win. No, I agree with you. And it actually sounds a lot like the advertising industry because there's a 33% turnover rate in the ad industry. And I think so many of the problems that people sort of bark about online about that business and, and maybe others are similar is that we never have enough time to get to know people and therefore we don't trust each other. And we don't know each other's sort of invisible signals of, of how they're you know moving into a different state or whatever, all that stuff just never gains traction. Um, so I get all that. And I think that, that that's super critical to pay attention to. And then I think on the company side, you know, I think about how you foster that. And one of the ways I wonder is, and you get into this in the book a little bit, what, what might be the benefit of a company not being so polished in their presentation of themselves? you know, to give more of that unvarnished truth of who they are? What what rewards might they reap if they made that choice? Well, two things that happen right away. One is you're going to get talent that loves your brand of crazy. Mm -hmm. Right. So the talent coming in the doors and go, hey, this is crazy, but I can't yeah. believe mm -hmm. right? So you're going to get people that affili affiliate to the way that you believe work should be designed. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing that you get is you get the ability for people to show up with a little bit more authenticity in their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, you no, know, like, especially in creative pursuits, right. The more authentic I can be, the more that creative voice is going to come out. Absolutely. The creative voice comes out, the more the products that we're creating are better. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, you know, I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, along with that, I think the other thing that I watch organizations sort of struggling with now is coming out of COVID you know, we thought the only way to provide people flexibility and to get them to stay is to do a remote or a three, two, or to change the very nature of the way that we come to the office. Mm -hmm. I look at that now. And I'm like, you know what, that may be true, but I think it's, I think it's 
incomplete, mm. right? I don't know that the conversation employees are having about whether or not I want to be in the office. We mm. are we are sort of built to have a community, mm -hmm. love working with people. Mm -hmm. We enjoy coming together for gatherings and celebrations and all these. We're human. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, of, hey, I don't feel like I'm going to get that if I come back to the office. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I think there's also this piece. The organizations have to start putting people in proximity. Mm -hmm. Times that it really matters and start focusing our together time in building depth of relationship. Like right? how many times have we both gone to like company all hands mm -hmm. where all you do is you sit in a seat for like eight hours a day and just get pummeled yeah. with content, right? Yeah. I'm like, those days are gone. Yeah. Right now, when we're together, I think content should be 5% of the stuff that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And 95% of it should be we're going to build the social capital. Yeah. Allow us to have the trust to do our best work as we come through the hardships of the of the year ahead. Yeah, I think that's been one of the hardest struggles coming out of COVID is, and I think you can you can solve for those problems in a remote, hybrid, or on-site environment, but you have to be very intentional about it and and very purposeful around the way you design time when people are coming together, and even if they're working remotely, set up opportunities for people to actually just talk and not just always have it be transactional. Um, so I love that. I love the idea of companies being a little more unvarnished. It's funny as, as somebody who works on brands, that's all we're telling our clients to do. Like, don't try to put a shiny, happy stock photo version of yourself out into the world. Grab your bet. Like your greatest truth is, is more raw and, 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 and like a little rough around the edges. That's what people will love. But yet when we do it to, to ourselves, we just aren't willing to do it. And I think all companies are like that. Um, there was one last quick term I wanted to bring up that I loved. You talked about re-recruitment. Can you quickly yeah. touch on that? I will. You know, it used to be in the days past, right? Early in our careers, probably TJ, when you had to re recruit people really once, right? You get them to come to the company, you give them a computer, give them a job, and then they sort of take care of themselves after that. Mm -hmm. I think now in this like age of infinitely browsing and this kind of crisis of commitment, everyone has FOMO. We're in this place where you actually got to re-recruit people every single day, mm. right? So the job of a leader has gotten a lot harder because every time you bump into a person, every time you pop on a Zoom, getting through the task is probably the least important thing you have to do. Yeah. The part of what you have to do in that moment is re-recruit them. And I, you know, I tell people, it's like just four basic questions. Answer four basic questions for a person every time you're with them. Mm. First, why is the world better with us in it? Mm -hmm. That gets it purpose and, and sort of meaning. Secondly yeah. is how you make money mm. that allows you to know where you sit in the system mm. and what your part in the in the wheel sort of kind of is yeah the third one is how do we get work done <laughs> right that is just like every time we bring in a new talent they're bringing all their ways of working with them and if we don't reset those re-recruit yeah. them they lose their way a little bit and last but not least is what's our own way bring promise to you mm. as talent for putting wow. clear energy into our company and I just think you got to re-recruit every day. It's a ground game, right? Yeah. Because the distractions are really heavy. I love and that. And someone getting picked off is, you know, it's 70-30 now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a brilliant approach. And the idea that it's just an ongoing part of your job as a leader rather than some formal process, I think, is really smart. Um, I know we want to we wind things down a little bit here. So I got a couple of questions I want to ask. First of all, this has been fantastic. I think, again, I... Uh, you bring such a, a good blend of sort of the emotional underpinnings of all this stuff with very concrete, tangible stuff. Your book is filled with good exercises. You've got those things you talked about, these excursions, which are just great ways to sort of uh, really understand some of these things that you're talking about, about yourself. Um, lots of tips, lots of just stuff in assessment. So I love that. Um, with all the stuff from your book and all that we've talked about, I, I want to ask, like, if you could wave a magic wand today and sort of fully desuckify work, what does that look like? I think for me, it, it gets really simple. It's been, you know, this has probably been the edge of the stuff that I'm most curious about is I think we're on the cusp and it feels a long way off. We're on the cusp of someday really soon having someone's employee brand B come to work here and you're going to walk out healthier. Hmm. I like the sound I, of that. I, I, I stand back from the world, TJ. I'm like, we have everything we need to do it. Mm -hmm. Except for real commitment and courage. 
Mm -hmm. to get out of all these ways that we've designed work up until now. And I, I just, you know, I think human energy is a finite resource. It's a non-renewable. Mm -hmm. And God, if we could do that, if you could tell me that if I came to work there, I'm going to walk out healthier physically, mentally, emotionally, and financially. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd never go anywhere. Pretty irresistible. Yeah. So that's what I want is I want to, I want to go all the way. I love that. I, I always like, uh, aiming for something big, but that still feels attainable. Um, yeah. And I, I agree. I think I could, I could picture somebody leaning into that. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful of that. Are you feeling pretty optimistic that that, that can happen? I, you know, I think it can. I, I'm seeing a lot of really cool, interesting, small kind of prototypes or examples of a variety of companies doing things in that vein. Okay. I just cool. think it, you know, it's, hey, we got to bring it all together in a place and, and yeah. show that it's possible. Because once you do, like yeah. anything, then it, it's like, it's like the sub off. four minute mile. Once you break the sub four minute mile, everyone's going to break the sub four minute mile. Right. Yeah. So I think that's, uh, I think that's really sort of a, a place I hope someone goes. Yeah, I, I love it. I, I'm hopeful as well. Um, you know, the, the last question I ask before we give people a chance to kind of know where to find you is uh, I use sound effects a lot on my show. If you've listened to any of the intros, you'll hear cat sounds and then just other random sounds that some of my other guests have made. So I invite you to add to our growing library. Uh, Andre, do you have any any sound effect here you're willing to share? Hey, I'll give one for you. So you have to understand the context behind it is I'm both uh rabid sports and music fan mm -hmm. and one of my favorite moments in both those venues is when literally the crowd goes wild and so i'd share with you just a <laughs> just the crowd sort of on their feet going crazy is is the sound that that sort of lights me up the most oh that's awesome yeah i can feel that definitely um yeah, that's awesome. I love it. It will show up in our in our show, probably somewhere in the intro. Uh, and I think that'll be a lot of fun. So yeah, Andre, how can people find you and learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm active out there a lot. I post a bunch of content. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a site. Uh, it's www.wrongfitrightfit.com. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be relaunching a newsletter. So it goes out weekly. It's called Monday Matters. It's meant to really just give a few practical tips to make this next week mm -hmm. a better. Yeah. And right now that's, you know, that's mondaymatters.substack.com. It's going to switch platforms and it'll be out probably starting in, in April again. Okay. That's awesome. And I also uh, definitely recommend people, you know, run over to Amazon or wherever they like to buy books and get your book, Wrong Fit, Right Fit. It's it's a great read. I, I listen to it. You read it. You do a great job reading it. And it's just chock full of, of stuff that both inspires you and also gives you really tangible stuff. So I think highly recommended. Um, Andre, this has been a really fantastic conversation and uh, I'm glad you could come on and help people learn more about how they can find their right fit and, and really start to thrive at work. Well, thanks, TJ. You made it easy. It's a fun conversation, man. We'll do it again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Andre. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to the Desuckify Work podcast. And thanks to Andre for bringing real-world strategies and a fresh perspective to the show. You can follow Andre on LinkedIn and check out his site, wrongfitrightfit.com, where you can learn more about the work he does, helping to chip away at the $8 trillion in lost productivity due to disengagement. You should also totally sign up for his newsletter, Monday Matters. It'll start your week off right, and maybe even quiet the Sunday scaries. You know what isn't scary? My website and my Substack newsletter. You should totally check them out and see how you can suck the suck out of your work life. And if you really want to go crazy, let's set up a free 30-minute desuckified discovery session. I'm sure we can fit you in. See what I did there? Fit? Like the book? No? Okay. I'll go now. Bye, everyone. Bye.